Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 188. Session Zero is not just for RPGs. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live is the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us here live on Twitch. So tonight we have someone looking for suggestions on how to handle Session Zero, a popular role-playing game topic, but this time this is for a board game group. After that, we've got a review of Ven, a new party game from the op, and we finish up with our usual weekend review where I've got additional thoughts on the Ghost Betwixt and more. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Let's start off with a few comments on our Point Salad review. Co-opel of Nerds says, Point Salad is in our massive backlog. It looks super simple. Thanks for sharing. And Peter Schott says, I enjoy the game and look forward to learning more about Point City as those details become available. Mm -hmm. This is pretty easy to explain, but still has good decisions on what to take as a scoring card versus veggies. And then finally, Mr. Green Eyes 77 says, hoping to see more videos like this where you deep dive an apparently simple game. Sweet. Well, thanks so much for the comments. Um, as for co bump this up to the top. Also, great name. That is a great podcast. I, actually, I think they're a YouTube channel. Sorry. YouTube channel name. I love that. co of co of nerds. I dig that. Uh, though this isn't a co-op game, because I assume they generally look at co-op games. I did watch a couple of other videos. Solid. Um, bump this to the top, though. Seriously, it's worth it. Points out it's that good. Plus, you're going to hammer through it. It really doesn't take that much work to learn. As for Peter's comment, I'm also now curious about Point Silly. Point Silly? Point Salad, sorry. Point City. Um, Point City. Wow, I can't even get that out. Point City. Point City. Point City. Um, I honestly wasn't expecting to love Point Salad as much as I have. And at the time when Point City was announced, I don't know Point Salad. So I was just kind of like, eh, it's a, it's, it's a new game coming from the same people. I will wait till reviews come out. But now, now with how much we've been enjoying Point Salad, I really want to check out Point City. And I'm now more paying attention to what's going on. And I'm following it on Board Game Geeks to see what's going to happen. And Green Eyes, I'm glad you dug the review. Uh, we've got some more later game reviews on the way, like our chiseled review that went live on the blog this week. Uh, next week, you'll be able to watch the YouTube version. And then tonight's review of Ven, I think, also fits that definition of apparently simple games. Next up, we're going to swap spots. We should have had it swap on the screen <laughs> screen right here. It would have been funny. Uh, because the next three comments, sorry, next two comments. I cut one out. Next two comments are from our look at eight supers RPG article that got shared in a superhero RPG group to a bunch of people who totally did not get the point of the article. Um, since that article shares Sean's thoughts, I'm going to let him respond to these. So we're going to start off with Nestor D. Rodriguez, who says, I would heartily recommend Prowlers and Paragons Ultimate Edition by Eagle Beagle Games, which has recently reorganized as Mobius World Publishing. It's a system that's both easy to grasp and th flexible in its use. In fact, I would likely recommend it too. It's just that I hadn't read it for that particular article. <laughs> Next, we have JR, who writes, The only quibble I have is saying that Mutants and Masterminds is going to be too crunchy for most groups. After character creation, it's just D20 plus modifier rolls. Less crunchy than Dungeons and Dragons, the world's most popular role-playing game. The problem with Mutants and Masterminds is you need to get to the game in order mm -hmm. to get past the, the crunchy part. There, there was an interesting question on Twitter this week about how much time people want to spend making characters. And when it comes to stats and powers and skills, the, often, the answer is often a lot less than it takes in Mutants and Masterminds. No, there were other comments in that group. Uh, feel free to look it up on Facebook if you wish to. Uh, but these were the, the two most interesting and the ones I felt most worthy of a reply. So let's finish off with a comment on our Red Bernus Algeria 1857 preview. Richard III, a.k.a. Knife, writes, Great review. Thank you for putting it together. 
The game also sounds and looks great. I like your idea of referring to the AI as simply the French. Really good. I shall certainly be backing the game. Best wishes, wishes Richard III. Well, cool to see this preview still getting hits, though at this point, um, the Kickstarter is done and over with, fully funded, which is great. Now you can pre-order the game, though, so you should still be good, Richard III. Should be able to just go to the Kickstarter and click and do the download thing, or sorry, the pre-order thing right from the page. I don't think this one's going to hit retail, so I think that's your only way to get through it. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Just one announcement before we move on. Uh, so today I met with the dental surgeon and I do have my hospital visit booked. So it's going to be on October 14th. Now, recovery time for this surgery is more than 48 hours. So I'm not going to be in any shape to record live on the 5th of October. As well, the timing may impact some of our other regular releases as well. I was basically told take the rest of the week and weekend off. So don't expect to be up and about and getting things done. So no show on the 5th of next month, two weeks from today. We're here to answer your game, game, your game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Emmett O'Brien, who clicked on Ask the Bellhop over at tabletopbellhop.com to say, Hey, have you done an episode on Session Zero? Maybe how to establish a starting agreement for board game groups. Maybe different sized groups. A lot of people are put off by formal agreements. Maybe how to set expectations in a conversation. Well, hey, Emmett. Uh, long time no here. Uh, thanks for the great question. And while we have mentioned Session Zero uh, many times and how important it is many times, we have not actually done an episode on it yet. And I've got to say, it's probably been a long time coming. So here we are. All right, so I guess we should start by defining what Session Zero is for listeners. All right, so usually when you hear the term Session Zero, it's in the context of pen and paper role-playing games, where traditionally it meant the first session. Before you start to play the game, you all gather together and everyone makes characters and the DM works on maps and you do world building or whatever it is you need to do to start playing the game. It was always generally pretty mechanical in what you were looking at. It was the stuff that's required to play the game, nothing outside of that. Right, and I think really it's that pre-game prep, more than character gen, that has really come to the forefront of discussions on Session Zero. Yeah. It's safety tools, scheduling, general agreements, and understandings about what will be happening. Right, like over the years, this initial session has evolved to be so much more than just a character generation session and making sure your party talks about how they got together or something like that. Nowadays, a good session zero should be about a lot more than making characters and should actually start before even the game you're going to play has been chosen. Now, the thing is, this is all in role playing context up to this point. There's no reason this concept, this idea of getting your group together before the game night should be limited to just role playing games. It can be just as important to have a session zero with any group sitting down to play games together. And honestly, this is something that can and probably should be extended to any social gathering. But tonight, we're going to focus on board game groups. Okay, so let's get into this thing. Why the heck should I have a session zero? All right, so the main thing is the whole point of people getting together to play games together is to have fun, to have an enjoyable experience together. You want people to show up, have a good time, go home, and even better, talk about that session years for come. Remember that night when this happened, that game night. What you don't want is disappointment, boredom, miscommunication, or at worst, someone getting hurt. Well, how do we do that? <laughs> Okay, so the big thing Session Zero is about is setting expectations. This is a huge thing. You will hear us talk about expectations and getting buy-in on almost every episode of our podcast where we're not just recommending a bunch of games to play. Pretty much every topic we talk about for improving your game night starts with communication and expectations and meeting those. We want to make sure everyone is on the same page. You want to make sure everyone knows what's coming, there are no surprises, and you know how to deal with any potential problems before they come up. You don't want to be inviting 
the hardcore Twilight Imperium gamer who doesn't play anything less than a 4.0 to your game of party game, you know, fluffy party game night. <laughs> it's yeah, just exactly you, know, you need to everyone needs to expect the right thing at that game night. Yeah, what your first steps like I'm going to start like I'm focusing on this as in one game group, not a public play event. I'll get to that. We'll talk to that about that. But I'm talking about like you're just trying to get a game group together that Wednesday nights we're going to play at Joe's house and 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 get together every Wednesday or every third Wednesday. Or perhaps you're going to meet at the local Tim Hortons uh, the first Monday of every month or you're going to go down to the Legion for card game night. And try to introduce some new games to the group. Like, nah, that's getting more into public play. You're going to go play at the Legion with your group at one of the big tables and have some cheap beer and get some Legion food. Whatever, whatever it is you happen to be doing. I'm, I'm talking about a small knit group of people getting together at this point. Personal, and, personal party groups. Yeah, yeah. Like you're a game group, not a game club, not a game event, not a game party. A, a, your personal game group. For, this is tips for personal game groups. So the first step is to find out why. Is everyone here? Because it might not be what you expect. What is everyone expecting out of the experience? Now, I'm not saying you sit down with a pen and paper and everyone writes an essay on why they're there, but just like, so we're going to get together and play games. Why are you coming over? Why do you want to play games? Some people, the reasons might be, I just want to hang out. Like, I enjoy spending my time with you folk. I want to hang out. I'm going to have a few beers. We're going to relax and we're going to play some games. But then the person next to him is like, whoa, wait, wait, beers? We didn't talk about beers. You're going to come over and we're just going to, if we're just going to have beers, I'd rather sit and watch Netflix or make fun of TNA wrestling on TV or something. I don't want to do that while I'm playing my games. And that's the conversation you want to have, the back and forth. You want to find out why people are there. What do they want out of the experience? Are they there to play games? Are they there to challenge themselves? Are they there to burn their brains? Are they there to try new games they've never played before and have experiences? Are they there to have a, a big event night where they have some good food and they try new games and it's a whole Epicurean thing? Or is it just someone who's like, you know what, I'm bored. I just want to show up and play some games. And then maybe someone else like, you know, I just want to play games I already know. And I want to relax, sit back and forget about work for a few hours. And now we're talking about, uh, in this case, most mostly been talking about, you know, groups of friends who get together. Yes. This can also work for your family game mm -hmm. night. If you're having a family yes. game night, your kids are probably more involved than just mom and dad told us we had to play games on Thursday mm -hmm. night. They will still, so. yeah, they will still have, even if, even if they are told Thursday night is game night, don't schedule anything. They will still have ideas about what they want to get out of it. You mm -hmm. know, maybe why they're there is because mom and dad told them to, but why, what they're going to get out of that. They may have ideas. Maybe your daughter only wants to play card games you know maybe she loves magic uh maybe your son only wants to play the duke uh, you know and and you need to uh, sort of accommodate and understand why everyone's mm -hmm. there even if it's family um not everyone's going to want the monopoly night every thursday <laughs> and listen to our episodes on playing games with kids to learn why you shouldn't force your kids to join you for game night in the first place it Lights. should always be their choice you should invite them to join you if they want to play every Wednesday, you should. You should have a session zero with your family. So the other thing that why we want to do this, why do we want to have this is you want to know why everyone, what everyone wants out of it. And you want to cater the game night to that experience because the entire point is for people to have fun. The other thing that comes up when we talk about this and now we are not experts on this particular category, but is safety. And by safety, yes, I do mean getting paper cuts on the board game and don't uh, don't play the giant wooden Jenga necessarily, but I'm talking about safety tools. Not all games, board games included, um, can be harmful. You, They might bring up topics that are uncomfortable. They might um, bring up uh, racism. They might bring up nasty words. They could bring up uh, the fantasy trope of rape is extremely common, both in board games and role playing games. These are the kind of things that honestly can be perfectly fine with your group, but you need to talk about it. You need to discuss safety to find out, are there any boundaries? Now in role-playing games, we call it lines and veils. Uh, a line is a part in the game you never cross, and a veil is something that we do off screen. Well, veils are probably not gonna come up during most board games, but lines definitely are. And, and if you're playing escape games, some yes. of these lines and veils may actually be more important 
than uh, than other things because you'd uh, escape games, horror ga- and horror games in horror particular. Games, yes, um, there there can be things that you know may have maybe maybe more upfront than you would like. Yes. Now again, there's lots of topics out there on safety tools and tools you can use. And I, I, that that is not our topic tonight. Is safety tools for board games might be another one. But trust me, there's no reason not to have an X card on a table when we're board game night. I was once playing a game of Nitwit, which is a game where you were trying to link different words together and kind of well, this kind of fits with our little review later. Kind of like a Venn diagram, but it's like loops of thread and different words getting tied together. And we sat down and there was a combination of three words that made every person at the table think the same thing. And it was very obvious we were all thinking that. And I literally said, okay, we're gonna stop right now. How blue do you want this game to go? Are we going to allow swear words and sexual positions and body parts and things like that in this game? And that's all you do is you stop and you ask. Well, the three players who were playing the game was like, yep, we're good with it. And then we read off our clues and we were perfectly, well, we checked there were no kids around, (laughs) read off our clues and got a bunch of points for making some obvious connections. Another thing that people don't necessarily think about, because in an RPG, it's probably not going to come up, is um, levels of learning ability uh, and Mm -hmm. and skills. Uh, If you're all sitting down to an RPG, odds are pretty good. You're all, you know, the similar education background. Uh, and you're probably all going to be able to read to a certain degree. Uh, whereas if you're all sitting down to a board game, there may be different levels of both language skills mm-hmm. and reading ability. Uh, and knowing that up front, you can avoid the games that are reading heavy or yeah. you know lean towards them or, you know, focus on games that are all icons and don't need to do. And that's one of those things where it is a purely comfort level. And I consider it a safety issue for your players you do not want to be having your players feel bad because everyone Mm -hmm. else is having a great time but they're struggling to read the clues or the cards or the board here's a good one that just came up in the chat i'm not going to read the whole thing maybe we'll go through it in the lobby but they mentioned someone in the chat darkling blight mentioned that there is a person who shows up their game fight who has a problem with swearing swearing at the table there is something i would have never considered I play with Deanna. They're swearing at our game table. They're swearing at our game table if we play with the kids. But you know what? I never really said, hey, Tori Cata, you guys okay with the amount of swearing Deanna has here? Actually, I think Dee did say once, she's like, if you want me to tone it down, I can. Uh, we did say the opposite. We said, no, don't worry about watching your mouth around our kids because it's not something we were concerned about with them growing up. I didn't think we were going to ruin their small minds by some nasty word. But that's a good example of something you probably don't even realize that someone could take offense to or have a problem with. Absolutely. There are certain religions out there that have different feelings on things. And you may have no idea that this Mm -hmm. friend of yours is a member of that religion because they're just a cool friend who you've known for years. But it turns out, oh, they, you know, can't have charcuterie on on Fridays because they don't eat meat and they are offended by swearing. Yeah. Good things to know if you're about to set up a regular Friday night game night. Now, here's a real life experience. Playing a game of Descent Journeys in the Dark. I can't remember what edition it was. Played through first three scenarios, say, perfectly fine. All of a sudden, in the fourth scenario, the giant spider miniature comes out, and one of the gamers leaves. Gets up, leaves the table, grabs her keys, goes home. Severe arachnophobia. If we talked about that ahead of time, now this wasn't my group, so I, I should say this was not my group. This is not my experience. I'm reiterating experience someone else told me about when talking about safety tools and role playing games with the board game experience. Um, they left. They they literally left the table. Um, and it was kind of like, well, you know, if we'd known, we could have just easily swapped those for hellhounds or whatever. Whatever, swap the mini. Even you don't put the mini out and say this represents a it's a spider, but you know what? We're going to put this out for that other player's sake. Yeah, no, absolutely. So it is a thing. Uh, it's it's amazing how certain phobias in particular can, mm-hmm. uh, you know, emerge. Uh, <laughs> for instance, the other night, uh, I went to bed and I started reading a new book. Uh, and I f- changed over to a new chapter. And that chapter was directly referencing a person going through something that represents my phobia. Um, it, they were in a situation I would not deal well with. I had to put the book down. I Put my Kindle down, walked away, because I I literally could not at that point in time read that without having an Mm -hmm. anxiety attack. And and 
I was just reading a story and there is very little the difference between reading that text off my book yep. or reading the text or having the text read to you in a board game. All right. One more, one more example before we go into actual things to talk about specific, more specifically is we are currently playing the ghost be Uh Right in the first opening paragraph of that game, a child is kidnapped. That is the premise for the game. That is something before sitting down to play that game, you should okay with your group and say, are you cool with a child being kidnapped and honestly tortured later in the story? So are you okay with that? Okay, it is a horror game. It's about a haunted house, but the cover of the book makes it look like Scooby-Doo. Yeah, haunted house doesn't say child torture to me. Right. (laughs) At all. Uh, sitting down with that box in front of me, and I have sat down, I've seen the box, I've seen the setup, I've seen mm-hmm. the bits and pieces. Um, I've even seen the monsters, which are comedically designed. Yes. Um, the, the you know, you've got a whole bunch of monsters and baddies there, and none mm-hmm. of them are serious. <laughs> I mean, there, right. there's, you know, evil raccoons are are, are, are on no, the... No, literally, uh, raccoons wearing pumpkins. Yeah. Jackal lanterns. And, and... If you told me that there was going to be child abduction and torture in this game, I yeah. would go, whoa, I'm bringing this back to the store, possibly, because possibly, it is so yeah. misrepresented um, in yeah. that particular case. I, I wasn't yeah, aware that there was torture. I, I was not aware that there was torture in this game. I knew uh, I knew about the kidnapping because I was there for that. Part. Well, heck, I'll, I'll spoil <laughs> it again. Fair warning about that. It is not descriptive, but there is detained on an altar. Right. Now, it doesn't go much further than that, but you have cultist, child detained on an island. Again, a child, right? If it wasn't a child, it yep. might not have bothered me as much. But anyway, enough about specific games. So what I want to move on to now are things you should cover in a board game session zero. Now, this is not meant to be exhaustive, but it does seem long. Maybe you don't have to talk about all these things. And honestly, I got to say any session zero is better than no session zero, but you should try to do the best you can. If you're not comfortable with bringing up all these topics, maybe it's something you can work into session one or two or three sessions in, kind of get into it. So one of the so first these, things. Right. Yeah. So right. these are in nope. no particular order. Yeah. So, I mean, first off, uh, one that a lot of may, some groups may really be able to skip. If you are the group of friends who have been hanging out yeah. together for years, it may be no issue. But who's attending? Um, <laughs> is, is Jane bringing her partner? Is Bob bringing his partner? Is, you know, our wives allowed? Are kids allowed? Can you bring um, a guest? Yep. Yeah. So, you know, if if if, if it's well established that, well, we're the guys who are playing games and or we're the folk who are playing games and we have been doing something every week for years, mm. maybe not an issue. But it's still worth at least mentioning, you know, hey, if you're going to bring somebody else, let us know in advance or let's, yep. you know, we'll have a discussion and then you can quickly skip by this. But if you're setting up a new group, yeah. this is something you probably want to address. Who's going to be there? Who's going to be there? The next, pretty obviously, where's that going to be? And when's it going to be? And yes, we know all the problems of scra- scheduling game nights, but make sure everyone's on the same page. Are you going to play at the same place? Is that a Mo's house on Monday nights and it starts at 8.30 every week? Or is it, say, like Jeff Seuss's group where they play at a different house every, whatever, couple sessions, they switch houses? Or is it you're going to meet at the local game store or the local library or wherever it happens to be, and when is it going to happen? This, everyone should know, and it should be well communicated, especially if it's not Moe's on Monday. Moe's on Monday is pretty simple. But when it's, we're going to play at the CG Realm on this Saturday and we're going to play at easy mode on this Saturday. And then we're going to go all the way out to Leamington the third Saturday of the month, just to check out a talk gaming and play some cards that needs to be communicated to everyone. And that's where I actually do say, write it down, use Facebook, create events, use your Google calendars. There's lots of ways to schedule things, but make sure that is clear. You want this to be one of the most clear things out there. Well, no, it's not a safety tool, but this is still a session zero topic. And and to be fair, that one of the big confusing things on when is when people say things like every second Saturday of the month. Mm-hmm. OK, is it every second Saturday of the month? Is it every other Saturday? Is it, you know, be clear as yes. possible, uh, like things like every second Saturday of the month can really confuse people easily. Yes. 
um especially you know when you get the five week uh month i was gonna say the, the <laughs> worst one for events i ran is i used to do something special if there was a fifth week right if there's a fifth saturday <laughs> in the month we do this special thing which to me was memorable and i thought it'd be cool and it was like one of those things it only happens four times a year so it's a big deal everyone forgot yeah everyone forgot uh, and when it comes to where uh make sure that everyone is able to go to a place yes uh you know if you have someone who's working on their 10-year chip chip don't go play at the bar um mm -hmm. you know there's there are there are definitely things um but you know places that certain people can't or refuse to or don't want to or shouldn't go yes uh, so just make sure everyone's aware and clear this is where we're going and is that going to be a problem with anybody mm -hmm. uh, transportation is a big part of this too and actually i guess that'd be part of the what how how are you going to get there is someone going to pick people up are people going to carpool are you taking a bus are you taking a U uber is the person taking the Uber responsible for paying for it? Or is the group willing to split the cost so that you can game with your friend? Um, and one thing I want to stress that I don't know if we really got to here is these are all decisions that should be decided by the entire group. There shouldn't be, well, for role-playing games, the game master or whatever, but this shouldn't be like the event organizer or the core host or the, you know, the the game guru, the the alpha gamer. I hate the term alpha, but you know what I mean? Uh, just because it's Moe's game night at Moe's house and Moe owns all the games doesn't mean Moe gets to make all the decisions. Next so, up, yeah. Oh, yeah. It is what do you do if some of that doesn't work? So most importantly, I want to talk about the host. And this is something I never even think of. And I got to thank our, our patron, Jeff Seuss, for making me more aware of this, is what happens when the host can't make it? Um, so whoever is the person you're playing at their house, if they aren't free, what happens? What do you do? Have that backup plan in place before it happens for the first time. And more importantly, keep it consistent. Don't switch it. Oh, Mo can't make it this week. What are we doing? Are we going to play? Do you want to get together here? Have a backup plan. Now, this isn't as big a deal with board games. Most of the time you can just cancel, right? You're not missing out anything. But if you're playing a campaign game and you're trying to get it done in a certain time or you're on some kind of time constraint or you're playing something that's been left set up for a week that you want to return to, that's more of an issue. But when you're just having a normal game night where you're just playing casually, you probably just want to cancel. But again, I've said this before when talking about game nights and events, the more you cancel, the more easy it becomes for people to cancel again. And you almost kind of want to get together with everyone and do something just to keep that time slot. Yeah, no, and there's, and there's a lot of different reasons. Sometimes, you know, if you're playing at people's houses, this becomes a bigger issue. The, if the host can't make it, and they, that you probably can't go play at the house. Yeah. But if you're playing at the uh, at the FLGS, there are things that happen there too. Oh, mm -hmm. you know, hey, I just found out Thursday night there's a big magic release magic party. Pre -release. They're doing the pre-release party. There's no <laughs> tables there for us. Are we, you know, even so, even if you're playing, even if you're not playing at someone's house, even if you're playing at Tim Hortons, uh, one of my one of my local Tim Hortons just shut down to do a full reno. Mm -hmm. um, they left the, you know, you can't go play in the drive through <laughs> which they left open. So where are we going to go? You know, at, even if you're not playing at houses, you still need backup plans. Yes. Um, next is, okay, the host is there. The event can happen. There's nothing getting in the way of playing. But what if people can't make it? Now, again, Role-playing games is a whole topic on its own. What do you do with the campaign? Who plays their character? Do you, none of that matters for board games. Again, unless you're playing a campaign game. Now is probably not the week to continue your Goom Caving game if someone can't make it. But maybe it's the time where you sit there and you play a um, what are they, the random dungeons or something like that. And again, cancellations aren't bad. We've said this every time we talk about cancellations. People are adults. They have real lives. Games are meant to be fun, but they're games. They're hobbies. They're pastimes. Other things come first. Family, health, friends can all come before that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Don't be the uber grognard who's mad at their friends because they canceled on a game. It's a game. Get over it. But know what you're going to do. Um, you have a group of six. What happens if one person cancels? Still get together, right? Play a five-player game. What if two people cancel? Are you going to play four-player games? Why not? What if three people cancel? Do you want to play three-player games? Is your group into that? What if everyone but one other person cancels? That should all be kind of figured out ahead of time. And again, figured out with the group. Maybe it's completely different if your game teacher cancels than if the person who just cares about playing late party games and is mostly there to have fun, fun with everyone else cancels. Very fair. So uh, another big important thing is how long is the night going to be? Uh, yeah. You know, I, 
when you're teenagers and you're staying up all night doing a break for Taco Bell, coming back, hitting up the slur, you know, super slurpees and <laughs> gaming until 4 a.m., that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Many people are now gaming as adults, however, and may or may not have children or partners or jobs that impact our schedules significantly. Mm -hmm. So plan a time and stick to it. Uh, and and especially this especially goes for you know you've got that one person in uh, who who can't who you know doesn't have the job right now or is right. what you know independently wealthy and just wants to party until four a.m. still but everyone else might have jobs so make it clear up front and center yes sorry I I get that you want to play all night but the rest of us can't we're all going to be leaving at ten thirty p.m. and stick to it. Like if you set a limit, stick to it and don't be the mo. Don't be the guy who's like, oh, come on. We just just one more turn. Play one more game. I'm kind of bad for that. But I, everyone knows I don't mean it that much. I guess I'd like you to stay. But yeah, I know you got to work tomorrow. So go ahead. Stick to it. Um, One of the tricks I have for that particular one is I will say we are going to play until at least. And that way people can commit the time. But then the hardcore players who want to stick around and play another game still can. Um, again, that depends my venue. I can do that. Right. I, I don't have a job to go to in the morning. I work from home. And, and when I was running events at bars in particular pubs or bars, there were two reasons I did this, but uh, which we'll get to another topic in a minute is I would call the cutoff at 10. I am hosting this event until 10. There will be games to play until 10. After that, if people want to stick around and keep playing games, that's up to them, but they're no longer at my event. They're just here at a bar playing games. And that allows two things. For one, it puts a firm limit on, hey, 10 o'clock, I'm no longer supervising, which is an insurance issue and other things like that. I am no longer responsible for the players who are playing games. They are just patrons of the bar who happen to be there playing games. And second, it lets those people who show up late and who are hardcore and want to stay till two, whether they're drinking or not, to get in as many games as they can, keep playing without making everyone else stay. No one should feel ob obligated to stay. Right. Absolutely. So uh, another thing is, and this is this plays on a lot of the things we've already talked about, uh, what ages of people, you know, again, yeah. this is, you know, who's attending, what ages are, if we are going to say, hey, yes, absolutely, you can bring friends, you know, everyone, yep. everyone's allowed to bring one person to game night. Well, do you want them bringing the 10 year old to a game night that you're going to be playing, mm -hmm. you know, something, you know, I, I don't know, Gloomhaven, uh, whatever. Uh, or maybe you want to sort of say, I think we're going to keep this 16 and up. You know, we're all adults yeah. here and, and we don't really want to have to tone it down to younger kids levels. So we're going to say the cutoff is 16. Yeah. Or again, like we talked about adult games and those aren't necessarily bad games. As long as your group's on the same page, you are welcome to play them. And I have no problem with it. You just have to be careful if you're playing in public because your game is going to influence people around you, not just your group. But when you're playing at home, play whatever you want, as long as all the people playing that game are on the same page. And in that case, there are many games you may not want young kids to attend for, right. whether they're vulgar games, sexual in nature, whatever it happens to be. That's why you might want to put an age limit. Absolutely. And then the next reason for age limits, uh, and this sort of goes hand in hand with age limits, is alcohol. Are you going to allow alcohol? Do you have yeah. any people who are intolerant of alcohol for any reason, physical or otherwise? Um, there's a lot of reasons alcohol, you know, personally, I rarely drink. Um, yeah. I can drink, but I've also got some medication that I don't like to drink too much uh, uh, because of. So while if Mo wants to get absolutely sloshed, I don't mind, but I'm only going to have maybe one. Yeah. And, and again, personal choice. This should be up to you. But again, agreed on by the group that's the important part here dave wants to drink every week is fine as long as everyone else there is fine with dealing with dave <laughs> and personally i enjoy drinking and playing games but my drinking game nights are very different from my non-drinking game nights and we plan the nights around those at least when we know they're coming we got we got blindsided by one the other day <laughs> but in general as long as we know it's happening it's like hey are we drinking tonight okay i'll make sure there's beers in the fridge and my game selection will change so there are things now the one thing to watch for with alcohol of course is who is going to be responsible if people do have too much and you're gonna have to have a very serious conversation about driving home if you are the host not only as a good friend or family member you should be watching for this you are also legally responsible for anyone leaving your house so there are a lot of other considerations once alcohol get involved 
And again, we're, I don't want to get into the minutia here, but make a decision on if it's allowed or not. If casual drinking is allowed or deep drinking, like all of that, hard alcohol. Like if you are going to allow alcohol, there needs to be some more talk. Not just, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, we allow alcohol. Who's bringing it? Who's paying for it? Who, who gets the first round? Any, all of that's part of it as well. Because when you start doing Jagger shots, you're no longer able to have re- rational discussions about yes. it at that point. <laughs> it's too yep. late. Exactly. Um, next one I want to talk about is quitting games too early, uh, partway through. Honestly, I hate to say it, and I know people hate it, that you should never quit a game partway through, and I totally disagree. There are many reasons to quit a game partway through, and the most important is if it is a safety concern. If someone is bothered by a game, I don't want to use the buzzwords that everyone hates. So if, if, if something bothers someone in a game and they want to stop, let them stop. This should be something everyone should be perfectly cool with. This shouldn't even be a debate that this is a thing, but unfortunately in many game groups and with many gamers, it is. What they call it in role-playing is the open door policy, and I firmly think it should be in place at every game table. If for any reason you feel uncomfortable playing a game or something bothers you, feel free to get up and leave with no reason given. And yes, it sucks for the other players. Yes, it's frustrating. You don't get to finish your game. Yes, the competitive players are going to hate it. But all of that, is it worth hurting someone, causing harm to them, upsetting someone for a game? No, let them get up and leave. And it's also worth noting that depending on the games you play, if that person chooses to leave, the game may not actually end. You may be able to complete the game without that person. But even if you are able to, do you want to? As a group, yep. you need to decide that. Maybe we are playing a game where, okay, well, we just take them out. We don't calculate their score, and fine, the game goes on. But as a group, agree on that in advance, because you are making choices then at that point that uh, that can affect uh, yes. that person later on when they come back and, and find out you just went ahead without them and are all chatting about the end of the game that they weren't able to, or for yeah. whatever reason, uh, chose not to partake in and i we've talked about playing host before the host should get involved there there should be a little bit more going on but in general quitting part way through should be allowed uh deanna saying unless you're playing competitively in a tournament or something but that should have its own session zero like framework i i still say if it gets to that point doesn't matter if you're a tournament or not just get up and leave like tournament organizer will have to figure something out no if you think this could be a problem, you shouldn't be signing up for tournaments. But again, sometimes things come up you totally don't expect. Absolutely. Safety of the players is more important than who wins the tournament. Absolutely. And which, uh, yep. Go ahead. Which brings us to our next topic, uh, and that's harassment. Uh, and this can take uh, many forms. It can be as simple as when player X gets a couple too many drinks in them, they start making suggestive comments that are not acceptable by some of the other players. Mm -hmm. That's harassment. Uh, Or it could be, uh, you know, you've brought uh, everyone again. Everyone's allowed to bring guests. We're all welcome. All of a sudden, somebody starts making unwelcome comments towards one of the guests. Or the guest starts making unwelcome comments towards somebody else. How do we deal with that? And it's not policies, not just that kind of harassment either. No, no. People start casually throwing around uh, racial slurs or or homophobic words get start getting tossed out in the middle of the game. Um, I, every time I say it, I think of Xbox Live chat, right? Like if your your game group starts going there, it can bother people. Well, it you should bother people, but well, <laughs> yeah, true. understandably, understandably, there we, there are it will bother it some go. people more than others. I would uh, say. But yes, no, absolutely. Uh, any um, isms, essentially. Yes. Uh, you know, maybe you've got your atheist friend who won't shut up. I tend to be one of those people. But if you also have your religious friend who you equally enjoy playing games with, find a way to make those people <laughs> agree yeah. that there isn't going you, uh, you know, regardless of your beliefs, allow everyone else's beliefs at the tables to go on so long as they're not hurting anybody now basically here you probably don't need a documented thing for your group for if it's a group of friends or family you should just at least talk about it 
with your group. Again, this is session zero. So you got six of you sitting around. We're talking about playing games. We've decided what games we're going to play, when we're going to play, all this other stuff, how long. And then we go, okay, what do we do if someone does have a problem? So you get asked, what do we do if someone has a problem? Well, what if Sean lets slip something that bothers you, Dave? What do you do? And in some groups, that's going to be, hey, if I say something inappropriate, call me out, please. Like, you know what? I was raised in a society that taught me to think and talk in certain ways. And I've now learned they're not acceptable, but sometimes it slips through. So please call me out. Another group might be like, you know what? Don't bring it up during the game. Like, just maybe give me a shush, a little symbol, and we'll talk about it after. Or, you know, whatever it happens to be. Again, these are things to talk about. There's no necessarily you need hard and fast rules. Now, if you are going to host a public play event, you need hard and fast rules, but that's something different. Absolutely. Now, one of the things that we can do is uh, to uh, to help avoid this or at least help deal with things when they happen are safety tools. Yeah. Now, there's all kinds of these. Again, I mentioned earlier, I don't want to get into details, but there is no reason not to have an X card on your board game table, uh, especially if you're playing with strangers. Like If you're allowing guests in or if you're playing in public or if your game group changes up a lot of weeks, they're very useful to have. There are other ones out there besides the X card. Just the X card is probably the most well-known and easiest to explain. Um, you might want something there, especially if you expect there to be problems. If your group plays a lot of horror games, if you're expecting like you're going to have a Cthulhu weekend, maybe if you don't use safety tools every weekend, you might want to pull them out for that. Or if you're going to play Swords and Sandals Conan the board game, I'll admit I haven't played my copy, but knowing some of the content in Swords and Sandals, I know it can go places that are uncomfortable for some people. Now, that might be a description, but you say, hey, you know what? This particular game might go around the wrong way. Let's put this in place this week. They don't have to be there all the time, though. I still say open door should be there all the time. That's my personal belief. And, uh, you know, I'm going to I hate doing it, but uh, I'm going to call out Cards Against Humanity. Uh, again, we don't necessarily like the game, but a lot of people do. And if you want to yep. play that at your, at your house, uh, again, not in public, please don't play Cards of Humanity at public events. No, but if you want to play that at home, Absolutely. And your whole group agrees. And, and you're all on the same page. You've gotten to this. You've gotten this far down the, the yes. list and everyone is still on board with playing Cards Against Humanity. Have an X card because it can go places that will make people uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, I have I have been in situations where not Cards Against Humanity, but similar games have been played with in-laws at the mm -hmm. table. And wow, can things get really awkward really fast. Yeah. My standard house rule for Cards Against Humanity, not that I ever play it, is anyone's free to throw out any card at any time and draw a new one. That was a house rule from one of my friends that I actually totally agree with the last time I played it. They're like, if anything makes you uncomfortable, you see it. The problem is that doesn't help when someone else plays a card, but at least gives you some control over the right. card. Um, I, I don't think we need to really talk about that separately, so I'm going to skip that and finish off with a little something a little bit more positive in a way is competitiveness. This you're, has come up a number of times. <laughs> you're here to play games. A lot of the questions I get are based on this. A lot of the questions that come in are asked the bellhop. What do I do with overly competitive players? How do I keep overly competitive players happy? Um, what, 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 there's lots around this. And I hate saying competition is bad. It's not. And co competitiveness isn't bad. And I try to win every game I play. That doesn't change. But I think any game group would probably come to the agreement that they're there to have fun more importantly than they're there to win. That may not be true of every group. Maybe be. your social contract is completely different than mine, where you're talking about this. You're like, we are going to play from these hours to these hours, unless there's a game in progress. And then we will play for 20 minutes more until the timer goes off. We are only going to play four player games. All four player games will only actually run if all four players are present. When we're playing the game, you will not go to the washroom. You will not eat. You will take or you will not do any of this unless it is the player to your left's turn and you have enough time to take a break before getting back. You can play in a group with that. And that is totally valid. I personally don't think I'd have much fun with that, <laughs> but that can be your group. Right. There are that's what you're there. into. There are absolutely people out there who want that level of strict eyes on the table competitiveness. We are here to play games. Let's play more power right? to them, but you're best not to mix those people with, with non casual yes. gamers. Uh, because again, I, I, and, and this is, this is something that comes up uh, from time to time. Whereas there are times uh, at FL at the FLGS, when Mo is going to play a certain game 
and I'm probably going to go sit at another table because Mo is going to be more competitive than I am. Yeah. Uh, I, I generally, as a board gamer, am a play to have fun. I could not care less about winning. Uh, and it's not like I'm, I'm not thinking about winning. It's not like I'm not... It's not like, like you're not trying. Not trying. But if I don't win, I could not care less. And if I have seen some horrible mistake I've made, I don't care. I really don't. I'm just there to, you know, hang out with mm -hmm. friends. Uh, and I am much more the casual game, despite the fact that I do like some heavy games that can get yep. pretty competitive. Um, even with those, uh, you know, a lot of the times, especially because I don't play games as much as some people, it's much easier for me to go, well, you know, I may I'll probably never see this game again. So let's just have some <laughs> fun with it. Now, on the opposite end of competitiveness is you also want to find out if you have a player who doesn't care. Sean tries to win, but I know people in the local gaming community that once they're at a table playing a game with you are a force of chaos. They have no interest in playing the game to win, playing it competitively, or even trying to play it correctly. They are going to do whatever the heck they can to make fun for themselves by causing havoc with everyone else. I personally do not usually enjoy playing with these players. I will play with them at a local game store when I know who I'm sitting down with and I know what kind of game it is, and I'll play the same way. I will sit there and just explore. Like, that's when I'll play whatever game that they want to play, and I try a new strategy, do something else knowing that they're there. And yes, it sounds fun being the chaotic neutral character in the role playing game, just like being the chaotic neutral player at a board game table. Honestly, I'm sorry to say it's probably more fun than, for you than anyone else at the table. One of the so, times you'll see this come out is, you know, the person who thinks Catan is super overrated. So if someone plays Catan, they'll they have they don't hate the game, but they'll sit down and, you know, oh, I can do this and this and this and this with the thief and we can do this and we can block every time and and just you know again ruin the game for the other people because they choose not to like the game yeah uh and that's not okay again affecting other people yes. is the problem and again the group uh, you're going to talk about this if you have a player like that okay so this is gonna i'm gonna jump to another topic that wasn't in our show notes here but know what you might find when you have a session zero your group doesn't work that happens that's okay don't believe the geek social fallacies. Just because you grew up hanging out with Sean and Huge and Dave doesn't mean you have to role play with them or play with them every Monday. Yes, it kind of sucks, but find something else to do. Obviously, gaming wasn't meant for this group because you all want different things out of it and they're competitive. They're, they're, they're conflicting. That's the word I was looking at. They're conflicting. You may find that you can't come to an agreement. Now, I will say most adults should probably be able to come to some kind of compromise where you can be like, you know what? Why don't we do it where we'll switch houses and when we're at Dave's house, we play party games and silly games and Joe can go crazy and do his silly stuff. But when we're at Sean's house, we're going to play serious games and try to take things more seriously. And heck, let's put some money on the line to make it more interesting. And then when we play at Mo's house, we're going to sit there and all we're going to play is social deduction games over and over and over and lie to each other all night and know that there's no hard feelings at the end of the night because it's all a game. Maybe you come up with something like that, but it is possible you find out through doing this exercise that maybe your group is not the right group for you. Absolutely. And it, it's this can be tough because sometimes it's just one player and it could be, you know, you know again, uh, Mo and I, you know, have been together, I've been hung, hanging out off and on for 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe I'm the player who doesn't want to do what they want to do on game night um that's hard no one's saying yeah. it isn't but it is if it's best for the group to say no you know what sean you and i can play games on saturday afternoon uh friday night i just don't think it's the right game group for you let's uh yeah you know, it's not gonna happen okay you know i'm an adult <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm gonna play games you know i'll go find another group that has those games or i'll go play at the local flgs right. or the library or whatever uh, i am an adult and can take that um but that doesn't make it easier it just means that adults should be able to do that yes you should be able to have that conversation which i gotta admit that's the one that scares most people away right people don't like confrontation i don't know think of it as a game the the goal is to have the perfect game night and with the perfect group who's all on the same page, it's all going to sit down and have fun together every week. 
if you can't get there, you got to figure something out, right? Rebuild your engine, change your strategy, whatever that happens to be. There you go. All right. Since we're talking about board game events, everything we talked about at this point has been like location, people, attitude, the food and drinks. We didn't talk about that. Food and drinks, another one. Who's bringing food? Are you eating? Is food allowed at the table? I'm not going to bother getting into that in detail, but that's another thing you should be talking about. A food, whether you can eat, who's going to bring food, who pays for food, all that fun stuff is something else you should talk about. I, I missed that on my list. Now, board game event. The one thing you know is going to be there besides gamers is games. And honestly, I think there's some pretty specific things you should talk about in particular for what games are going to be at your game night. Starting with what games? What, what, what do you want to play? Uh, you got a group of six. Are we going to play six player games? Or are we going to play two, three player games? Are we always going to play a heavy game? Are we going to start the night with a filler, a, a, you know, an app, a pair, or no, no, an appetizer and sit and play something quick. Then we're going to play a, you know, heavier up to two hour game. And then we'll finish off with a one hour aperitif. And that's our, our four hour game session. Let's make it a five hour game session just so there's room in between. Or are you going to sit and play the same game every week? You love Catan. Your group loves Catan. We just want to play more Catan. You know what? Every month, maybe we'll add in a new rule, a new house rule, or we'll pick up an expansion, but we're going to play Catan every week. Or I only like 18xx games, but they take too long. We only have two hours, so we're going to play in Mo's Basement. We've got the giant table, the magnetic table set up, and we're going to take our turns. The only thing we need to do is everyone must get in four turns every week. As long as it takes, you're getting in four turns before you go home. No, you can take turns during the week if you fall behind. You know, whatever it happens to be, what games are you playing? And you can, and it can be as simple as, hey, you know what? One of us is going to buy a new game every month. We're going to have a schedule. Someone buys a new game every month. And for that month, that's the game we play. Yeah. It can be, it can totally be, fair. you know, uh, it doesn't have to be this game and this game. And we've got a list here and these are the game. No, no, it can be, okay, we're going to go with the new game. We want to mm -hmm. play the new hotness. That's what we like. So when the new hotness shows up, that's what we're playing. Now, it can also be you get your game group like I did mine to say, hey, I review games. We're going to play things about five times each. And I'm also going to be playing with a couple other groups. But I'm going to show up some weeks and I'll be like, we're playing this because I need to play it. Other you times I'm going to let you guys pick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that can be your agreement. Uh, next, who brings the games? Who Whose games are you playing with? Like, I happen to have a big game collection. It's pretty easy. You play with my games when you're at my house, generally. But you know what? Tori and Cat have shown up with games. Sean's come down with games. It happens now and then. Whose responsibility is it to provide the games? Uh, possibly more important to your group is whose responsibility is it to pay for the games and purchase them in the first place? Again, it doesn't have to be one person. There is nothing wrong with the group splitting on the cost of a game. And no, I'm not trying to like hint at something here. We, we I, I take care of the games. That's fine. That doesn't have to change, but it may matter to other groups. Now, here's another thing that goes along with that. Who's teaching it? Because yes. it isn't always going to be the person who buys the game, who brings the game, yes. or who live, or who even lives there. It could be someone else who just happens to be really good at teaching either a game, that game, or games in general. Yes. We talked about this in, in, in various other episodes, but there is nothing wrong with uh, me buying a game, getting it shipped to Sean's house, and then Sean giving it to his son to learn, and then us all getting together and sean's daughter teaching us like there's no reason you couldn't do it except for very far away and all that <laughs> but i'm just saying like there's no reason one person should be handle all that responsibility absolutely all right here's one people don't think of and should be talked about when you're done playing what happens at my house everyone at the table sits and helps us repack the game into the state it was in when i go to my friend jamie's house you literally box dump into the lid He'll take care of it because to him, that's fun. He enjoys repackaging his games. For him, that's lonely fun. The next day after game night is reorganizing everything the way he likes it. Totally fair. There's kind of two ends of the spectrum. Maybe you literally just box dump and put it on the shelf. I met those gamers. They scare me, but I met those gamers. <laughs> that's a thing. I, I once sat down to play Chaos in the Old World with someone who literally took the box and went like this and lifted it up and everything went bleh. And I'm like, oh my. Okay, then. <laughs> I mean, you know, some people, you know, there are people out there who have uh, whatever uh, conditions and need to have things in certain ways. Yes. That's great. Make sure everyone knows. Make yep. sure you know that you're, if you put things away in the wrong spot, 
this person is going to get upset by it. It's going to bother them. It already on his heart set. It's going to bother them or something. You know, mm -hmm. make sure everyone knows that. Yep. Uh, what are you going to do to protect your games? Like, if you're playing with your game group, do you make sure to always have sleeves? Do you have any rules about where your drinks are? Not on the game table, please. Do you eat food while you're playing? Do you eat greasy food? Are there limits? Do you allow chicken wings in the middle of the table? And you put it right on the desert in Catan? Like, I did, it totally depends on your group. Chicken wings Is there and Cheetos during your yes. deck building games. Exactly. Uh, but let's talk about this, right? Like, this is something that should be discussed. And then follow up to that is, what if something gets damaged? This is something a lot of groups don't talk about. And it has come up at a couple of our public play events. Um, personally, I'm pretty good with it with my friends. If something gets damaged, it's fine. Most of my games get played enough times. Any game that's played enough to get damaged, generally, I'll just I'll buy another copy if I want it that way. Or I'll find some way around it. But maybe... Uh, you need something like, hey, if you you break it, you bought it. Like, you you bend one of my cards in Terraforming Mars, you now have a shiny new copy of Terraforming Mars, and you can buy me a new copy when you get a chance. This one's now yours since you're the one that broke it, which I personally think is better than you buy me a new copy and I keep both. Personally, I find if someone damages, ruins one of my games, they get to have that copy, and I would expect a replacement, depending on who it is. And and again, session zero, this should be talked about. If if only one person's buying the games, it's really not fair to make them buy replacements if something gets damaged. Maybe damage becomes like insurance, where people, the group, then gets together. Like, ooh, we ruined Moon's copy of Terraforming Mars at the game night. Maybe, you know what? It's, what, a $60 game? Let's all throw 10 bucks in. Let's get a new copy for the group. So and the next thing is, who owns it? Or where is it? Or or if, if a group owns it, because, again, there's no reason only one person has to buy a game, uh, where does it live when you're not playing it? What, do you, does your group have a game library? Is it everyone bringing their own games? This one's very important to put in a session zero and possibly document in case someone leaves the group. Especially if it's someone who contributed to the games. What are you doing with that? Honestly, in my opinion, the understanding should be as the game stays with the group, however members are left. And I guess there's a last man standing when you get down to the last two people that are then the group breaks up and then you got to figure it out. But like, you should talk about this. Again, that's our entire point tonight is these are things you should talk about. These are things people don't realize they should talk about. All these should be talked about before they happen. So you at least have some way, know what's going to happen when a deal to. Again, setting expectations and then following up and following through. So next, we've got a few topics that all kind of sort of flow together. Yeah. But are there games, ideas, uh, topics that you don't play, that are, yep. will not get played at the table? that you refuse to, you know, don't buy these guys, don't bring them, we're not doing this. And again, that kind of goes to the lines and veils. It's the board game equivalent. No, I don't want anyone playing Cards Against Humanity at my house. No, I don't allow it in any public play events I play. Nor do I allow the spin-offs and the others. Any game that is sets out to offend people or gives the excuse for people to be nasty by saying, ha ha ha, it's a game, I don't want that at my game tables. Uh, Secret Hitler is another one where, yep. you know, that's a game that uh, should not be played in many places. Uh, in the chat room, D brings up colonization. That can be a very oh, touchy very topic. And there's popular. a lot of games that out there covering colonization. Um, maybe, maybe not playing those in public or if at all, if, if you want to play with them at all, game. you know, if you want to play with that at home, maybe that's fine, but maybe it's not. Yes. Um, and no, we're talking about banning games, but it's the opposite too. Like what's allowed. If you are fine with playing a whole bunch of games about colonization and being the colonizers and exploiting diamond mines and having slaves, if you're cool with that and your group's all on the same page, it sounds bad to say cool with that. If you're willing to acknowledge the problematic content in that and still play the games, that is your choice. That's up to your group. But again, you want everyone on the same page. Absolutely. Uh, that also goes for adult games if you get into adult content. There's nothing wrong with consenting adults playing adult level games at home in the pri in the privacy of their own homes. Uh, more power to you. Yep. But again, that's something that is between consenting adults in the privacy of your own home. A public mm -hmm. play event is public. Yes. Not all persons there may be consenting. Very like true. That. Not to, not to Every, mention everyone not adults. at the venue would have to be consenting. <laughs> right. You know, that. again, they must be consenting and adults, which again, yes. it's, if it's your FLGS, they may not all mm -hmm. be. 
Now, again, I mentioned this should all be talked about. You can document it. Um, we have entire episodes on forming a game club and having po- hosting public play events. That's where you really want the stuff written down and you want somewhere it posted. It's the wrong word because most of these, like if you have a game store, post this stuff, right? Post your, your rules, have a binder, whatever. But if you're going to have a public play event, you really should have this stuff documented somewhere. Uh, no, if it's using, if you're using like Facebook to organize events, it can just be on your Facebook page. It might be better to have it there in a binder or something, but you also don't want a new person to show up and be like, you have to read these 18 pages and sign this disclaimer before you play. So that's, it's, it's a little different there. Um, if you're running a con, that's also totally different. Um, the things you definitely want is a harassment policy. If you're doing public play, you want everyone to know who's in charge somehow. Whether whether it's just, you know, hosted by somewhere or just the person in charge, make sure to greet everyone who comes in, which you should be doing anyway. But everyone should know who's in charge and where to report problems, whether that's the person in charge or the venue or whatever it happens to be. Um, you also need someone to liaise with the venue. You might have a perfectly reasonable social contract, had a session zero, have your own rules, but it ends up. If you move those tables, the Teamsters are going to be really damn upset that you move those tables and put two together. Liaise with the venue. Find out. That's one of the most ones that like I couldn't believe was a thing, but makes perfect sense now that I know it's a thing. We had a problem with that at Origins, where we moved some tables and got in a lot of trouble for it, and I never even thought to ask. Um, and you also got to watch for venue-specific rules, whatever those may be. Whether it's, you know, it's a dry venue. They're, they still yep. exist. Uh, I've been to and I've, don't sneak some in under the table. Yeah, look yes. what we did. Don't and that, that. Include, that includes bev- fruit and beverage rules. Uh, yes. Don't sneak in snacks if the venue has snacks and is, yes. is you know, they are there for purchase. And there are rules saying don't bring in outside snacks. Yes. If Never bring in there. anything outside without asking. And and like my own personal rule technically is in the rule, but support the venue if you are playing in a public place buy something, spend some money. Like they're giving you the space expecting to make some income on this. Even your local game store, try to buy your games there, or at least buy your sleeves. If you can't afford the games or buy some dice, whatever, buy a miniature now and then support the store in some way. Absolutely. All right. You got anything else? Um, no, I think that about covers it. So that's it. I think for our discussion on session zero for board gamers, Now, I hope you got something out of this conversation. If this has inspired you to do a session zero with your game group, we'd love to hear how it went. Let us know in the comments below. Uh, Let us know on social media, but but speak up. And uh, if you were able to speak up about the board, your session zero, speak up to us about how it went. Yeah, I would love to share some stories, actually, in our, our, our feedback session at the beginning of our podcast, talking about how this went for people. Now, remember, we are here to answer your gaming and game night questions. This question came from a fan of the show. And if you've got a question for us, like Emmett, head to tabletopbellhop.com. Click on Ask the Bellhop. Fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Or hit me up on social media where I can found pretty much everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. All right. Well, now that you've heard our thoughts on a board game night session zero, do any of the lobbyists have anything to add and yeah there's plenty in the chat thank you chat room Uh, a lot of stuff we kind of brought up a little bit but there i don't know if you want to go through all of these comments but there are some fantastic comments in there yeah so we will start off at the top here dark and blight said never thought much about it in the sense of board games yeah since we just tend to show up and pick a game but i can see it being a good step for a legacy game campaign Mm -hmm. to figure out if this is going to even work or if they want to back out in advance. That's a yes. big thing. Commitment. Uh, you know, if if everyone seen, you know, is is there all the time, but you know, oh, you know what? We're actually thinking about doing a, a big vacation with the family in mm-hmm. November this year because we've got some time and it's working out. So that would be like an entire month off of our game. Yeah. Do we want to do that? Or do you guys want to go ahead and play through so that you're done by Christmas and, and not, you know our way through yeah it's a big you know legacy games uh have have a whole other sort of yeah, uh, aspect campaign games of uh of that session zero 
and re- you really want to do is have that conversation before anyone bought the game if you can because I, I gotta say I've seen a lot of people talk about how their copy of Gloomhaven still gathering dust because they can't the regular group's not up for it or whatever the case may be yep and uh, I've gotta say this is the reason we're having this episode tonight in my opinion we brought it up a couple times but people just don't think this is required for board games and I don't think people realize the problems that can come up. And I think most of us do. Like when you sit back and look at the various game groups, as long as you're not brand new to the hobby, I'm sure you know game nights that went south and why they went south and groups that broke up. And we probably could have mentioned the whole intergroup dating thing. I wasn't even thinking about that because like we're old and married now. And it's not and it's not the issue that it used to be in our, our teen years where there were, was definitely intergroup dating and where that all went to. That's all stuff should be talked about. Uh, and I got to say, with Young Teen Love, you probably can't say you're not allowed to date other members in the group, <laughs> but it's, it's the kind of thing you want to talk about. And like uh, uh, the example of the player who goes gung ho on all their games and tries to ruin it, I've experienced that many times, just as much as the hardcore player that wants to take everything seriously. And I've had different game groups over the years. I do not play with the same people I played with in high school or university or uh, it, like probably about every 10 year group. It's a different group of people I game with. Some people are consistent through it, but some aren't. Yep. Uh, we did discuss Darkling's second comment there. Um, we talked so, about... So one of the things to talk about there, he's noting that, that you tends to play with a group that are all on the same wavelength for acceptable content. Now, the thing is, you should still talk about it. Maybe you talk about it and go, yep, 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 that's what we've been doing. Yep, yeah, got it. Yeah, I always assume that. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's the unwritten rule. Yeah, yeah, we know. That's fine. If that's your session zero... Make sure everyone's on the same page. That's all. Me, you think you're all on the same wavelength until someone puts a spider mini on the table, right? Like that. That's the 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 whole thing is you don't want surprises. Absolutely. Uh yeah. I mean, uh, that's so. We've got uh, a little more talk about Ghost Betwixt. Uh, things like transportation uh, are really are a big thing when we were talking about yeah. the where you're gaming. You know, hey, look, yes. I can go. I can game when it's at Mary's and Bob's and Jane's, but if it's at Kim's they're not on a bus route and it's like a 25 minute walk to the bus stop. And I'm like, I, that's not worth it for me. Okay. Good to know. Let's, let's plan Mm -hmm. around that. Let's, let's make sure we schedule. Here's an important thing that ties into how long is your game night or many buses still running? Yes. For many sessions, we would get to 10 45 at night and we're in the middle of some, this happened to be a role-playing group, but it still applies. And we're there. We're in the middle of something. It's like, all right, guys, I got to go right now unless someone can give me a ride home because the bus has stopped running. The last bus comes by in 10 minutes. And I'll admit most of the time I was like, yeah, yeah, we'll give you a ride. It's good, but that's something to consider. Yep, when, when do the buses stop running? And again, cost. Uh, there is nothing wrong with your game group splitting the cost for the Uber so that your friend gets to actually play. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, uh, banning cards against humanity is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, again, to each their own. If you want to play at it. public play, they, at public, public play, play yes. events. Absolutely. Now I will admit the latest printings that did fix a lot of the problematic content. Um, but still, I I and I, sure I, I get that page. as a company they have done some fun things and some. They've also some done nice some horrible things. things. Yeah, they've also done some horrible things. And <laughs> the fact of the matter is that there are better versions. Of the, you know, apples to apples. Um, just you know, play apples to apples, and then you can choose where you want right. where you want your play nitwit. Yeah, you know. <laughs> right. Play no, Ven doesn't really. No, no Ven doesn't. That doesn't work. Um, nitwit has many drawing games. Yep. Uh, yeah, you don't hear as much about Cards Against Humanity right now. Yeah, again, Deanna saying that you shouldn't walk out in the tournament. You shouldn't, but well, you should only walk out if it's if there's a, like if the if the reason to walk out is important. It shouldn't be you walk out because you're losing the game. It shouldn't be you walk out because you pissed off someone took your spot in a worker placement game. It should be you walk out because your heart just started racing because something happened in the game you weren't expecting and you're starting to have a panic attack. In that case, walk out. I don't care if it's a tournament. Yep. And and I I don't know how to word that better. <laughs> I, I'm failing at English here, but I think people understand that. Yeah, no, there's it's it's tough. And then there are other things where, again, in a public tournament, uh, maybe walking out isn't the solution. Maybe going to the organizer is the correct solution. Walk away right. from the game, but don't necessarily leave. Um, yes, I, hey, I would. But again, if you're in the middle of a panic attack and you got to go, you got to go. Like, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but I think in, in general, 
tournaments that's you know like well, tournaments you have to have their own session zero that has yes. to be you know going into a oh, tournament tournaments technically have into. session zero usually yeah and some of it's just verbal it's online it's uh here's our rules here's our harassment policy here's here's what we expect of you if you sign up for this tournament right. usually it's a multi-page document yeah a contract is essentially a a, a distributed session zero you're not at all sitting yeah. around discussing it you're agreeing to the contract or not it's it's yes. a sort of a binary <laughs> session zero uh, anyone else got anything on? Uh, looks like I think we covered everything. Out of bounds discussion mm -hmm. topics. I'm not sure what that was in referred to, but it, again, what 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 should you be talking about? Oh, I think it's not, okay. I don't know if this is what Dave means, but this is something else we should talk about. Is what out of game things are allowed? What where we are like? Hey, I have done it. I want to talk about work, guys. We're here to play, right? Or you know what? My pet just died. Can we make sure none of this happened? Let's let's not talk about our pets tonight. Whatever. Or just, you know what? I want to focus on no the games. Or, yeah, no spoilers. <laughs> talk about spoilers. Or the opposite. Hey, you know what? We're going to play some light games tonight. Everyone's welcome to talk about whatever they want. Be distracting. You know, go talk about whatever. Heck, maybe at your table, that's you're going to spend half an hour just chatting about stuff. How casual is your game night and how much chatting are you going to be? Uh, like, I, play I, you know, there can be something as, you know, again, I, I mentioned earlier the whole, you know, atheist versus, you know, maybe no one talks about religion. Maybe yeah. you decide, OK, look, folks, yeah, age, sex, politics. politics is off the table. We do not yes. discuss politics here. We've yep. got great people we know who are both red and blue. We leave that at the door and we play the games. That's the rule. And, you know, fine. Um, yep. Maybe you don't want to put that rule down and you just like chaos. That's fine too just <laughs> be aware of what you're getting into do, do re again the important thing to remember is you're all gathering together to have a good time and play a game and set those expectations yeah it's all about the expectations most if you people know who that have the red and blue guys are going to be sitting at the table everyone needs to know whether or not it's going to turn into a knife fight yeah. or not <laughs> and what to do if it does that's yeah. all the should talk about ahead of time i say you give them you know <laughs> a civil war game to play or something and make it really <laughs> interesting like you might as well just lead into that um there's an interesting election game i heard about recently <laughs> there you go <laughs> and play some revolution of 18 whatever is 28 1828 uh, something like that i can never remember the name of that game uh <laughs> oh there's there's lots actually there there's making of a president and so on right so yeah if, if you all I'm have screening to be blue them state out yeah if you so all have any blue, blue state people and you know you're all generally fans of the same general leanings. Great. More power to you. Bring, bring the politics on. Yeah, uh, if that's what you enjoy. I, I, and honestly, if, if you're into that, there are games that cater to those conversations, and I would probably lean my group towards it. If, if you have a group that's into politics, all the power to you. That's, I, I have friends like that. Yep. That's not the kind of night I'm interested in playing in, but hey. All the yeah, I was actually, you. I actually, uh, it fell apart, but I had actually been deliberately uh, joining a podcast at one point. We tried to get off the ground that was literally a red, a blue, and a Canadian all mm. talking about mainstream politics. Um, that was, go. that was it. That was our ideas. Uh, that was, that was our concept. And unfortunately, our schedules were just weren't working out and uh, it never actually made it to air. But I was looking forward to that personally. Dave specifically said, my green boot politics talk friendly, but that's because I screened them out. See, screening them out, that right there is your session yeah. zero. You, you that, had a that's session That's exactly zero. what we're talking about. You just didn't <laughs> call it that. And I do think a lot of groups do it. And then you do it informally without trying. Like, that's how you formed your friend group and how your game group formed. And I'm sure your game group probably went through some iterations before it became the group it is now. And some of that was part of this. It's just the main thing we're trying to do is, is give you other ideas of things to talk about. Again, set expectations. Yeah. Everyone should be on the same page. There shouldn't be surprises. And when there are surprises, you should know how you're going to deal with them. I think that pretty much sums it up. Absolutely. So go out there, get together, talk about games and play some games and have more fun than you ever had before because you know why everyone's there and everyone's problem issues and everyone's joys and sit down that's it hey wait one final point talk about the happy stuff too what types of games do you like not what do you want want to play what do you want to play what's your favorite kind of game what games bring you joy what are your favorite moments and board games and how can we make them happen more often that should also be part of all this 
I, I just realized we had a very negative bent to this on avoid this, try to stop this. No, like it's it's both sides of the coin. Absolutely. Well, again, it's it's avoiding things so that everyone has the best time they can. Yes, is a lot of what is is generally what your session zero is about. It's yes. about finding out the bad so that you can never touch touch on it again and mm -hmm. the only thing left is, is the, good. the good it's it's a it's a sculpting of your group it's a, you know let's go let's talk chiseled again <laughs> you're sculpting chiseled. away all you're of the tool. bad and, and and left so that what's left is a core of everyone understanding yes. what's going to make it a great night over so and over and should, over again yep and in the end you should have a group with two arms five head, torsos and nine heads once you have a nine-headed group you know you're doing great are we Welcome to our review of Ven, a cooperative or team-based party game. Thank you, awesome folk at The Op, for sending a review copy of this game our way. Ven was designed in-house by The Op and just published earlier this year in 2022. It plays two or more players, with games taking under half an hour, except for maybe your first game where you're just trying to figure things out. This was originally released as a Target and Barnes & Noble exclusive, but as of just a couple of weeks ago, you can find it everywhere. Van has an MSRP of $24.99. That is in US. Probably should include that. Now, Van can be played either as a competitive team game with two teams or a cooperative game with everyone working together. In Van, players are trying to get their teammates to guess three words by placing some wonky, fun, abstract cards onto a Venn diagram. This is either done against a timer when playing cooperatively or against the other team when playing competitively, and you're incentivized to start guessing first by getting a bonus if you get your words correct. Now, for a look at what you get with this game, including some rather unique do-it-yourself Venn diagram boards for each mm. team, check out our Venn unboxing video on YouTube. Yeah, the most unique component here are these six thin plastic circles in three different colors that you use to make a Venn diagram for each team playing. Uh, you only use one of these when you're playing co-op. These are like super thin, transparent plastic and honestly one of the oddest board game components I've ever seen. These are basically the board for this game. Okay, maybe not the oddest thing I've seen in a game though because these cards are really wonky. They're like a mashup of emojis, clip art, stop photos, all kind of copy pasted onto each other. And what looks to be a pretty random way. Now, in addition to the cards, you also get a score track, some scoring markers, and two smaller decks of cards, one with word clues and the other with sets of three numbers. There are plastic stands for the lot. Finally, there's a decent box art included that has a place for everything, but definitely no room for any expansion content in this box insert. Now, one thing that was noted during our unboxing video by the awesome people who joined us in the chat room was that there is a lot of air in this box. The box seems to be designed specifically to hold the round plastic discs that make up the Venn diagrams. The way these are designed, you don't want to get them folded or creased, and the box is designed to prevent this, which makes sense, but leaves a lot of empty space in the box. Yeah, I totally agree. While I do have some other games out there with a lot of air, this one does stick out as having more than most. All right, now we know what you get in a copy of Venn, how about you give us an overview of play? All right, sure. So since there are two ways to play, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with a team-based competitive mode of play. For this, you divide your game group into two teams. Now, you will need at least four players, two per side, to do this. But after that, really, any player count should work as long as everyone can see the cards being placed. Now, while the cards are pretty large, tarot side, I would say, some of the details can be pretty small and are really only going to be seen by people sitting up close. This is probably the biggest problem with large player counts. I would suggest if you have a big group, having each group at their own table may help instead of having people to try and crowd around two Venn diagrams on the same table. Now you're going to set up your Venn diagrams, right? There's going to be one for each team. Now, note you only get two of these in the box, so you are limited to two teams. These are made by taking the three different color discs and putting them somewhere everyone on the team can say within every reach in your typical three triangle. I don't know how to describe that shape, but the, the basic Venn diagram shape. Now, except for the cost, I really don't see any reason you couldn't pick up two sets of Venn and be able to play with three or four teams. 
if you happen to want to play with a really large group, say over 10 people. Yeah, I don't see any real du disadvantage to this. Like I, you're going to end up with duplicate cards, but I don't see how that would ruin this game at all because uh, you even get four scoring counters. Well, you get two scoring counters, but they're two sided. So if you got another set of those, you'd have four scoring counters right there. Now, speaking of the cards, their next step is to shuffle up all the art cards and split that into three somewhat even decks. You don't have to count exactly. They just have to be fairly close. You're then going to pass one of these decks to each team, and their clue giver is going to take that for the round. And you're going to place the third deck by the scoring track and reach of both clue givers. This is where playing at multiple tables could fall apart a bit, but I'm yeah. sure you can come up with something that works for everyone. Now, the score track is put in the middle of the play area and has numbers 1 to 12. This is placed so everyone can see it, and four random word cards are placed next to it. Now, each of these word cards has three words on it, so you end up with 12 words each match to a number on the score track. This system is pretty brilliant as it adds a ton of replayability as different words will end up assigned to different numbers each game. Mm -hmm. Added to this, the word cards are two-sided, and there are a lot of them in the box. Finally, the last step for setting up each round is that each player draws a number of card, a number cards, right? Not a number of cards, a number card, which they keep private. Only they should see. Uh, you can use the included plastic stands to stand these up, codename style, or you can just place it face down after memorizing what numbers are in each. Now, each of these cards shows three numbers. The clue giver will look at the matching numbers on the score track to figure out what three words they're trying to get their teammates to guess for this round. Again, there's a huge deck of these, though they are one-sided in this case to make it easier to hide the information on these. Uh, the one key thing here is that you have to make sure your teammates cannot see the numbers on these cards. Mm -hmm. That would totally ruin the game. Now you're ready to play the round. Each clue giver now takes their third of the art deck and starts looking through the cards and placing them onto their team's Venn diagram. Now, if you're not quite sure how a Venn diagram works, basically you've got three overlapping circles. The outer circles represent one of the three words, each circle representing one word, not a specific one, but each one represents one of the three words. The next layer in, which some people call the inner circle, has two circles that overlap each area. So those are going to represent two of the words you're trying to get your team to guess. And then, of course, there's the center, which is going to represent all three words. The clue giver will be placing at most one card per region of the diagram though they can cover up a previously placed card if they happen to find something that's better than what they originally placed. Now, the most important thing to watch for here are the verbal and nonverbal clues. Mm -hmm. You don't want any of that going on when playing Venn. The clue giver should be silent, just placing cards, and avoiding even grunts and groans. On the other hand, the guessers should be watching the Venn diagram and the cards placed there, not the motions or body language of the clue giver. And you want this game to be all about the abstract art cards and where they're being placed and nothing more. Now, once there's at least one card in your team's Venn diagram, all the players on that team can start guessing and talking about what they think the clue words are. Now, at this point, you're not saying this is what we think they are for sure. You're just discussing it like, hey, I think this fits well, or I think it's that, or no, no, no it can't be that because look, there's a duck. Um, now, what's worth noting here, and something that's not obvious when first hearing about the game, at least I didn't get this, is that there are only 12 words in play. These are the only possible words that both teams are working from. It's not like you're just trying to guess any three words based on the cards. This is an important part of the game that to me wasn't evident at all until I actually started playing. Now, watching what words are possible clues is a bit part of the meta game of Venn. Looking at a card with a fish on it, but knowing fish isn't one of the 12 keywords this round means you need to look at something else on that same card that does tie it to the in-play words. Now, once the clue giver has placed at least three cards into your team's Venn diagram, note they don't have to be in any three specific places, you can decide as a team to make a guess. When doing so, someone yells out, Venn! And then the game stops for everyone. All groups, all players then stop. Each team then, starting with the team that says Ven, makes their three-word guess. The clue giver then reveals their card with the numbers on it, and the team gets one point for every word that got it right. Now, the team that called Ven also gets a bonus point if they got all three right. And that's your incentive to try to say Ven before your opponents do. After that, the next team's going to score again, getting a maximum of three points for getting all three right, but no bonus points for them. 
Right, there can be some interesting strategies here for the team that gets three cards down quickly. They can technically call out Ven when the other team doesn't even have three cards up, mm -hmm. which should impact their ability to guess all three words. But rushing and getting your own words wrong may not be worth that chance. Now remember, each clue giver only has one third of the art deck. Now at any point during the round, you can swap your deck for the one by the scoreboard. There's no penalty for this other than it takes time. And interestingly, if like both players end up swapping, it's actually possible to see every card in the game during one round, trying to find a perfect match. Now, this is something that is very player dependent. Some clue givers start tossing down cards right away, trying to get as much information out there as possible, while others are very picky, trying to find the perfect card for each mm. section of their Venn diagram. Now, each round after scoring points, you put out new word cards, select a new clue giver, and the game continues like this until one team scores at least 12 points. At the end of that round, whoever has the most points wins. And if there's a tie, it's the team that scored the most points in that final round that takes the game. That's how you play Venn competitively in teams. Now let's move on to cooperative play. Now this is much simpler because playing Zen, Ven, Ven, I almost said Zen, I don't even know why. I want to keep calling this game Zen. This isn't really a Zen game. <laughs> I guess it could be if you played really slow. Uh, playing Ven cooperatively is pretty much identical to playing uh, competitively, which is why I want to cover that first. Now, cooperatively, you're only using one Venn diagram and one clue giver who should rotate every round. Here, you don't bother splitting the cards up. The clue giver gets the entire deck. Now, here's the part where it gets interesting. You're going to start the game by drawing five numbered cards and stacking them off to the side. The rest can go in the box. You then, <coughs> excuse me. You then generate words as usual, right? You're going to have 12 words and play every round. Now, every round, the clue giver is going to draw the top of those number card decks, which they, of course, keep secret so no one can see it, and then has two minutes to get their team to guess three words exactly as I described above. Now, at the end of two minutes, the team makes their guesses and the clue giver reveals their number card. Now, the group only gets one point per correct guess. There's no competition here, so there's no Venn bonus. Now, the group has a total of five rounds to get to 12 points. Remember, you put out five uh, number cards. If they manage that, they win. If you run out of number cards before that, though, you lose. In addition to these two methods of play, there are two competitive game variants. The first is for a longer game in which you just play best of three with the first team to get 12 twice wins the game. The second is the expert variant, which forces the clue giver to place their first clues in the inner or center zones of their Venn diagram. Now, I will admit, I haven't personally tried these two variants, but I can't see them changing up gameplay that much. Like, the first sounds great for a big group event where you want to keep people occupied for more than half an hour, right? It turns your, your one-hour game night into an hour-and-a-half game night, or maybe even two hour with some time between rounds. And while the second one is a little odd to me, because already in our plays, I've seen the middle or outer regions be used first by multiple different clue givers. So I honestly can't see that having much of an impact at all. It sounds like we're already sharing some of our thoughts on Ven. So let's move on to what we thought of Ven. So this is one of those games from the op that I just had to try as soon as I heard about it. The concept drew me right in. It reminds me of Hues and Cues in that way, a party game that's doing something interesting and clever I've never seen before. Yeah, indeed. I was certainly intrigued as well uh, as how logic puzzles of this nature might play out in a gamified manner. Now, what was most interesting to me about Ven was that I had absolutely no clue how the game was going to actually play and feel at the table when re learning the rules. Now, with like Hues and Cues, I read it and I'm pretty much knew exactly how the game was going to play after reading the rules. This wasn't the case for Ven at all. And I'm guessing people listening now may even be having the same pro problem, not quite getting how exactly this works. Like many party games, the people you play with how into it they get and what kind of thought process they have are going to impact how the game plays with mm -hmm. your group. We've all seen examples of people playing charades or Pictionary who are sure they're giving the most obvious clue, but no one else there understands the direction they're coming from, at how they're getting to that answer. Now, the part I didn't really get until playing was that you're trying to get the team to guess three words from a subset of words which is why I actually stressed that in the game description, because the how to play video I watched didn't really point that I didn't get it. And I watched an actual play and I still didn't quite get it. This really makes a huge difference. 
You're not trying to figure out what the person's trying to say from each card and what the card means. No, you're trying to figure out what part of that card ties to up to three of the 12 words in play. And also knowing where it's played. If it's on the outside, it's one thing in that card that ties to one word. If it's played in the middle, there's three things in that card that ties to three words. It's this limiting of clue space, I guess we'll call it, that really makes Ven work. And work even better than I actually expected it to be when I first heard about this game. Though at the same time, this might actually, for some more advanced groups, make it too easy, or at least easier than they expected. So then you could probably just toss in a house roll where the clue giver writes down three words, or even better, write down three words and give them to the other team. <laughs> other highlights include the amount of replayability in this box. The way the word cards, number cards, and that 1 to 12 number track combine really works well. The two-sided word cards are also really quick to set up, especially since you put four out for one round, and then when you start the next round, just flip them all over. Nice and quick and makes it nice and fast between rounds. Um, drawing new cards is quick too, right? You just grab four cards off the top of the deck. And when you're shuffling just now and then, remember to flip the deck upside down. The sheer number of cards you get is also impressive, which also led to an interesting bit in this game that I didn't realize, when again, reading how to play, watching how to play videos, is that both teams could very well be trying to guess some of the same words. I don't know. You might even be able to guess exactly the same three words. I don't know if the number cards ever duplicate. I didn't. I haven't seen that happen, but I have seen two words in common. And that's something, again, I didn't even consider. I personally found it fascinating that both teams could be, in a way, fighting over the same cards, trying to find the perfect match for the same words. It would be interesting to see long term if you start to know the image deck and start looking for that card that yep. you know can drop in the middle or perfectly blend two words that you've got. Now, the most unobvious thing about this, and this is the thing I can't really see how to communicate well is except through a play when a review like this, is what we found to be the most fun part. And that's the period at the end of the round where the clue giver tries to explain and sometimes justify their card choices and where they place them. Our games included lots of, okay, wait, how does this relate to rigid? What, what, how does that mean rigid? Or why, why is that? Why'd you pick that card for love? Or the opposite side of, hey, how could you not see this card has an animal for zoo war because the animals look like they're about to fight and loud because they're yelling at each other? Yeah, it's much like uh, the person in Pictionary trying to get you to guess Jaws by drawing successively bigger boats. Yes. Sure, it works when you hear them explain, we're going to need a bigger boat. But in the rush of the game, it's not especially helpful. Yeah. And then talking about the cards, I don't know what to say about these. Uh, other than to say they work, they work rather well for this game. I really have a strong feeling these cards were specifically created for this game and are specifically tied to the words included in this game. And due to this, I'm actually dubious about the game playing well if you toss in other art cards from any of those other games with whimsical cards in them. And I've seen a lot of people suggest this. While I think it would work, I just don't think it would work as well as using the cards designed for this game. This is sort of reinforced by the lack of any artists listed on the game. Yeah. Most likely it's a stock art subscription mashed together and quickly while looking at a word list to reference. Yeah, and I honestly think that is what happened here. I, I really do think this is a mashup of emoji, stock art, and clip art all kind of matched together. Now, this case leads to my only concern about the game. It's one Sean already mentioned, but I didn't want to call it out right then. Um, I am slightly concerned that groups that end up playing a lot of this game are going to run into a problem. Now, like the deck's huge. There are 100 double-sided art cards. That's 200 unique pieces of art. But I can see some players finding certain cards just right for certain words and i can also see the group think forming that happens with these kind of games say if brenda plays this card on the outside you know it means this word and i can see clue givers flipping through decks quickly looking for that one specific card they know is there and cards being used for the same thing over and over now honestly i think all this goes out the window if you just swap up who's playing with who when you mix up your groups or throw a new player in the mix Plus, it's only going to come up if you play this game a lot and in a frequency where players are going to remember the cards between plays. So this entire point may be moot, but it is a concern I have. I wonder if the simplest solution might not be manipulating the word deck, 
perhaps removing for a while some of the cards with words on them that have come up more uh, too often. So rather than worrying about the art deck, uh, limit yeah. the word deck, because again, there's a, there's a significant number of words. I don't know how oh, yeah. many, but there's yeah, enough in know. there that if you pull out, you know, 40 cards, even you're still going to have a lot of words to, to go through. Yeah. Yeah, that's possible. Now they said this may not even be a problem. Um, we do play games multiple times before we review them, but I definitely haven't played this enough to memorize the cards. <laughs> there are certain ones that I really like, though. And now what I know is, like, I know there's this set of cards that have animals on them, but I'm not looking for one card. I'm just looking for one of a group. Plus, there's a the whole thing where you dent, unless you're playing cooperative, you don't have the whole deck. And there's time limits and there's reasons you might want to rush. I don't know. It's, just, it's a concern. I wanted to point out my concern that this might be a thing. I have I can't confirm that concern, but the, I think the concern's that. All right, final thoughts. Overall, I was really looking forward to checking out Venn, and I'm glad I did. While the entire concept of a game using abstract artwork and a Venn diagram to get people to guess words sounds fascinating, it wasn't until I sat down to play that I learned just how well it works in practice. This is a very cool idea that plays honestly better than it sounded, at least to me. If you dig party games where one player is trying to get the rest of the players to guess something, like charades that Sean mentioned earlier, this is going to be the perfect game for you. This is that style of game. If you like team-based games, Venn's going to be worth checking out. This is one of the more unique, interesting, you split up into two groups and everyone's involved. Uh, which leads me to the next one. If you like quick party games where everyone has something to do every round all the time, this is going to beat out a lot of other games where people are taking turns. You're either giving clues or you're helping everyone guess together. I think Venn could be a great fit for a group where you want everyone involved all the time. If you enjoy funky art on cards and interpreting that fine artwork, uh, you're going to enjoy checking out the art in Venn and trying to tie that to specific keywords. I think I think there is a certain group, there are friends I know that will dig just that aspect of the game a lot. Now, if you don't enjoy real-time guessing games or being put on the spot as a clue giver, you're probably not going to enjoy Venn. So in the second case, I don't see why you can't skip over a player who's uncomfortable giving clues and just let them help with the guessing. If you don't like party games, it's a party game. This is very much a party game. This isn't the game for you. There's no strategy or tactics here other than realizing that your three words are a subset of 12. Beyond that, it's all social interaction, interpretation, and laughs. Personally, I'm glad we agreed to check this one out. I'm looking forward to breaking it out at bigger events like birthdays, Extra Life, and New Year's. I want to get that 10-player game going with four people guessing and one person giving clues. To me, Venn sits right in the middle of a diagram, including fun, easy to learn, and unique. Well, that's it for our review of Venn. While party games aren't really our forte here at B Tabletop Bellhop, now and then we find one that just grabs us and doesn't let go. What's a game that you enjoy outside of your usual genre? Tell us all about it in the comments below. One last thing. I invite you to also check out my written review of Venn over at tabletopbellhop.com where there'll be plenty of pictures of the diagrams with art cards on them. You can kind of see just how odd these cards are. All right. And now the tabletop's bell, the bellhop's tabletop. <laughs> the, the tabletop's bellhop. I think you do that every week now. Uh, we look back weeks. where we look back at the games we played since last episode. And I drool all over myself. I don't know what's happening. I can't drink. Got to the point of the show where Mo can't drink. <laughs> Trust me, it's just coffee. You smell toast. That's... It's, it's, it's ice cream flavored coffee. All right. So this week, um, mainly I only have one game to talk about since the other game I played is Ben. And we just spent the entire segment on it. But I do want to say a little bit more about Ben. So what I will add here is that this one was a pleasant surprise. I honestly didn't know what to think when I read the rules. Like I read it and I'm like, that might work. I'm not sure. I, I don't know how this is going to play. Like, how are you going to interpret these ridiculous cards? And until you see the actual combination of cards with words, like I said, I, I totally now I'm 100% on board that they designed this deck for this game. I think that this is a brilliant game, both cooperatively and competitively. Like, it even worked with teams of unease and sizes. We had two versus three. And it just, yeah, the clue giver turned around a bit more often on the one side. Now, what I think is going to be interesting, again, is if you get to know the cards, if that's going to matter. That'll be something I'll be watching for. But honestly, as long as you play a few other games in between, like how often do we play the same game week and week and week and week? 
And this is not a lifestyle game. Unless it's a <laughs> lifestyle game, I don't think it's going to be a problem. Yeah, and I again, if it, if it does become a lifestyle game, you can cycle all the word cards out. And the other problem, the other option would be I could see um, if you do start getting to that point, I'm you know make the time thing more more important, uh, or or make calling then more uh, give you two or points. Two points, yeah. Because again, you know, yeah, sure, you might know there's a perfect card, but you don't know which of the three decks it's in. And yeah. if the other team is just not caring about finding the perfect card and just slapping down yeah. their clues, you could be out. You, you might not have any words when you've uh, no, while true. you're trying to find that one perfect one that fits all three. The the most fascinating thing I've seen with this is how different clue givers play. Deanna is very much a bang, 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 get get a card in every region as quick as possible and then keep layering cards on top of them to reinforce the idea. And and kind of hope the players are paying attention to go, oh, wait, that last card also had wood on it. Oh, that card also has wood. Oh, look, there's a tree. Oh, there's a branch. Okay, is it tree or is it wood? Oh, no, she put a boat. It's got to be wood, right? Whereas Brenda, when she played, was very much, I must find the one card <laughs> that has the one thing on it very clearly. And then I need another card that has the one thing on it. Now I'm going to find one that has both of those on it somehow. And it was very different. Um, and my kids' interpretations of the cards were a ton of fun. I have some artistic, creative kids, and what they chose to put for certain things. Um, I, like I just want to record Gwen explaining why she put cards places, because that that was the most fun. It's just having her explain why these cards are actually related or represent what they do. Yeah. And like I said, I can't wait. I want to play a big group game of this. I said my, my only concern, like on my table, it probably worked because you could split up to both ends. Yeah, you've of the got table. a big enough table. But you gotta be able to see those 12 words. That's that's the hard part about splitting a group up. Yeah, you need a you need a projector to <laughs> you know yeah, overhead like, projector. Yeah, that would work. Well, even just a white, I, I don't know, a dry you're adding too much to them. Grab a dry erase board and write them out or put put them on magnets or something. I don't know. Uh so the other one I want to talk about, and I don't know how much I want to talk about this, I can't decide, is the ghost betwixt. So Last session, not like this one, like the one before, and I think I talked about this, we finished Scenario 3, which unlocked exactly what we were expecting to unlock, though I will admit some other stuff we didn't. Um, the, the, there's, I, I kind of peeked at it in the thing. There's more than you would expect getting added to the game, which is kind of cool. So it was like, yes, we totally called the one thing. Um, the most important part about that is, I, I, I can't, this is a spoiler, but it's such an obvious flipping spoiler, I'm not even going to count it because it's so dang obvious this remains a four player game is all i will say um other than questionable content we mentioned earlier in the show but again we already talked about this there's there's like greasy dude hitting on mom um when you find your brother they're they're tied to an altar um possibly about to be sacrificed or something like there there there's also some lack of player agency cuz there's like mental control there's some of those the, the adult horror topics which again if as long as your group talks about it ahead of time but like i would this is a one of the few games i would have liked a content warning on the box yeah i would have liked that on page one i would have liked to know that especially with the the look of the game yeah. the style of the art does not represent the content within yeah. the box and as and as well as much as i am not a huge i i'm still a bit of an old guy and the content warning thing hasn't really sink, sunk into me yet. Uh, I'm getting there, but it hasn't yet. But in this particular case, because of the artwork, I 100% think that a content warning belongs on this box because there are people yes. who will buy this, get it home, and go, oh my god, I cannot play this with my family. Yeah. So I will say at this point, if your kids watch Stranger Things, you're probably pretty good. <laughs> It's it's no worse than that, right? Like I'm I, I like I was I got that from when I was talking about it earlier. I'm like I'm talking about child torture, and I'm like, but it's child tied down in in bondage in not bondage gear, but you know in bonds, I guess is the proper term, right? Which is not everyone's going to be cool with that. But again, if you watch Stranger Things, terrible things happen to those kids. So it's at both that level. All right. Anyway, that that is honestly not my main complaint. It's it's a new complaint about the game that we kind of hinted at. But it's continued, right? Like even the whole mom bats, there's a specific monster that only targets mom and they're called mom bats and they only go after mom. Like there's just some stuff like that in there. Um, the big problem, though, is we played scenario four where it's supposed to speed up. I don't know where Sean read. It's supposed to speed up. Whoever <laughs> said that on Board Game Geek, 
I don't know if it was one person or a bunch of people, they're all wrong because there was no alcohol involved. Like I'll admit last week was a little slow, but Tori and I had a couple drinks. Um, no one drank. Oh, actually Tori did eventually, but its character was dead. So <laughs> no one drank who was playing the game. Um, it was over five hours and this was, we were playing. We didn't have snacks. We didn't break for food. We played for over five hours. That's long. Even worse, about an hour and a half to two hours in, two characters die. We had someone not play for the rest of the night for another three and a half hours. Uh, Tor grinded a lot in Dragon Quest on his phone. <laughs> I don't remember which Dragon Quest he's playing, but he's playing Dragon Quest series from like number one and up. So he played a lot of Dragon Quest. And this is a game where we tried to let him play the bad guys, but the bad guys just follow an AI. And when you're rolling dice, you just roll for everything. And like having Tor roll and Cat roll and then have to compare a dice just made the game slower. So like, yes, I wanted to say, hey, Tor, you play the bad guys, but it didn't really work. Um, So three and a half hours sitting there. Then we get to the boss fight because uh, there's no spoiler here. Every flip, and I'm going to say this right in the review, every scenario ends in a boss fight. We get to the boss fight, we died. TPK. Group's dead. And what you do now, reset the full health, retry the scenario. That's oh. what you do. There's no continuation. You don't go on. You don't go and don't get a reward. You don't start the next scenario with a penalty. Retry the scenario. So, yes, in a way, this is very JRPG computer role playing game. We ground that level. We, we got stuff. We got gear. We, we earned some money. We got some XP. Um, three of us actually leveled up. So the next time we play the next scenario, we are in better shape to beat it. But do I want to play that scenario again that takes five and a half hours? Now, on a positive note, we'll get to see new things and we'll get to see how the game changes. But it just happens. This scenario starts with three rooms in play and they're already in play and they don't change. Like, it's just not a good scenario with enough. And then you go through a door and something happens and you have other rooms to explore, but you won't get. The, the fun of finding random rooms or any of that because of how the scenario is designed. And I'm like, if we were going to replay one, I would have preferred it was any other scenario that we played so far because this one's very scripted. It's very much this happens, then this happens, then this happens. And we know all that now. We got to the end. And like, I don't know. We could come up with some house rule where we're like, let's just refight the boss fight. Um, Honestly, what we probably should have did is the two character deaths actually happened in the first fight. Um, the three tokens of monsters were spawned and the game did something cool. I did this. I don't want to spoil. The game did something cool to be more challenging. And we had people die in the first fight. And what we probably should have done is quit. Like not even record XP, like not, not like, Oh, we're going to keep what we got. Just like, Whoa, that was bad luck. We, we had some bad rolls. Let's just restart. And that probably would have been more fun for all of us. Right. Which again, I've said for Gloomhaven, uh, if it makes the game more fun, do it. Don't feel bad for playing on easy. This game doesn't have it easy. There, there is no way to make it easier. And it is very much a dice chucker, unlike Gloomhaven. Um, the luck of the dice is a big thing. So I got to say, we got to see some really impressive stuff. Uh, Deanna's character has become a powerhouse tank, like a ridiculous tank. Like that was the other thing is we're like, oh, the game's over and then we're going to go play something else. Wow, we're still alive. Wow, we're still alive. Oh my God, we're still alive. We must have gone 15 rounds of combat without with with mom tanking, not taking a single hit. So like that was impressive and would have been awesome. That's the other thing. It would have been so epic if we won. It would have made up for Tori being knocked out. Like if we would have been like, whoa, it was so close. I can't believe how well you tanked. But like even when Tori went down, you get so few hit points in this game, like two lucky hits and you're done. Next complaint, and again, I'm bashing this game pretty heavy. We'll see when I get to the final review. I, I, the final review, I think I'm going to have to wait a week or two after we finish playing before I give my thoughts, because sometimes I'm angry, but then a couple days later, I feel better. The game has two ways to miss. No game should have that. And this is something I always hated in role-playing games, is I shouldn't roll to hit you, and then I hit you, but then you get to roll some kind of defense, and my hit becomes a miss. That is not fun. That is not fun for any player. Maybe if you're playing player versus player duels, that might be fun and that kind of thing. But like player versus a monster or an NPC, that's not fun. 
It's the, yeah, I did the thing. I rolled a crit, especially if you roll a crit, right? You're playing D&D, you rolled the 20, and then you, I don't know what D&D uses, max double damage dice. When I played D&D last, when you rolled a crit, you rolled your damage dice twice, and you happen to roll max number on both, and you're like, oh, super crit, this is awesome, we're going to kill it. And you're like, no, he made a save, nothing happens. You're like, but it's super crit. I hate that feeling. This game can have that. Because you roll all these dice, and like you're fighting a wolf that's got a wolf pelt that gives it extra defense dice, and it's got one hit point left, and it's the last monster on the board, and you roll, and it's got three flipping shields, but you manage to cue off your um, pierce ability, so it ignores one shield, and you actually rolled three hits, so you super hit this guy, and then your damage dice is zero. And you're just like, seriously? And you used all your buffs, right? Like you rolled extra dice, you used your rerolls, you used your weapon fish, you did all the stuff, you made the roll, but your one stupid damage die rolls a zero. All but the highest damage die, and there are four levels of them, have a zero on at least one side. A house rule to this game, in my opinion, should be if you hit, you automatically do at least one. Right. And that's something I strongly recommend. Like it, it, it was just, that video I showed you of Tori getting hit was one, but like I could show you one before where he's just as happy and then realizes that he did zero. He's like, but you hit, you did the thing. And he's like, yeah, and zero damage. Now, Tor and Cat both argued, but the bad guys do the same thing. And I got to say, yeah, I, maybe if you do that for the bad guys, they do auto one damage. You probably have to give your heroes more health. But like, honestly, it's supposed to be fun. Like, like I kind of just think the heroes should do an automatic one damage or something. Right. Anyway. Yep. Scenario was neat. Um, the, 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 we got to try the new, the, oh, I'm not supposed to say that. We tried the new thing and it was fun. <laughs> it was different from the other four things. Right. So that was interesting. Um, different mechanics, introduced some new stuff. Um, vending machines have become a regular thing, which is cool. And a few new rule unlocks that work. Honestly, like the, the, the one new rule is actually kind of neat. Basically gives you an extra life, which we needed. Just doesn't give you two. Um, no, it was it, so on the fence about this game. Like we're having fun playing, but after five and a half hours just to redo it, that wasn't fun. Right. But we had fun leading up to it. Have you gone through the FAQ on um, like just as a as not as a to hey I, I can't find this rule check, but as a there's an because the FAQ is is like thirteen rules people are getting wrong sort of thing. I think uh, I have 13 rules most missed or something like that. I, I've read that thread. Yes. Okay. Oh, it's definitely a commitment. It is. It is a, you know, it is a chunk yeah, of time. 13 over. It says part one. Is there a part two? Uh, I don't think there is yet. It says be. part one, which makes me wonder. I'm going to look at it actually when we're done. When we get to the after show. I'll go through it quick. But uh, yeah, no, it, there, it is a big commitment. It's, it's not a, it's not a small game. It's a, um, like and, I said, it's it's almost Gloomhaven level, right? Like, the, there's only sixteen six scenarios, and maybe they expect you to fail a couple times. I don't know. Failing wasn't fun. Yeah. Some games, failing's like, oh, I want to try again. And honestly, I would have none of these complaints if this was a two hour game, as it says in the box. Yeah, I'm like, oh, Tor sat out for one third of the session. What? That's you know, forty five minutes at the most, thirty. Yep. Yeah, there are side There's actually ten scenarios, I think, in the base box. And uh, there will there is intent intended to be a second chapter coming out. They only yeah, released we'll half the game because it was costing them too much. Yeah. Uh, the, their original Kickstarter failed because it was way just, no one wanted too to much. spend so yeah. much money on on it. So they split the game in two. Yeah, like I said, mi mixed messaging. I bought got I agreed to review this because I thought it would be a fun light RPG style game to play with my kids. And that's totally not what it is. Yep. This is this is heavier than anything but Gloomhaven. Like every other dungeon crawler I played, Imperial Assault, simple compared to this. Like like right. Descent first edition, I didn't play second, even though I have it. It's in my pile of shame. I know it's terrible. And no, I don't own the new Descent. But like out of dungeon crawling games, like I was expecting Hero Quest with the custom dice, especially all the different funky custom dice. I was expecting Hero Quest. And there is some of that because it's you need more hits than shields, but it's so much more complicated than that. And we're actually at the point now where we have enough fourths of armor to get full points. And that's part of the game. You track fourths of things. Yep. Anyway, enough about it. See, I didn't know how much I was going to say. I guess I went on. <laughs> I 
I, I, if designer, if you're listening, please don't take this as a total bash against your game. Just you're, you're sending out mixed messages. And I think it's important you realize that. Yep. All right. Well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Uh, no ghost betwixt this week. Uh, Tori and Kat have one last weekend up in the cabin. So they're out of town far away up north. Um, due to that, Deanna and I are actually going to spend a night in Kingsville, uh, which might involve some two player gaming. Uh, I planned on bringing all the bus. I want to try out the expansion stuff we haven't touched yet, which I unfortunately learned you can't just toss in the deck. It's a swap out thing where you you take out a door and add a new door. So I am looking forward to checking that out. Got to check out those new uh, occupations. Yes, the new doors, the, the new maybe they'll totally change things. I have a feeling I, they add more PVP, which I don't know if I'll like. And I want to play them once with Deanna before we introduce them to everyone else. If possible, I would like to be reviewing all the boss next week because that's pretty much the last thing I need to do. I, I have pretty strong opinions on the game, and honestly, they're rather positive, but there's the scythe level of you need a bit of commitment to learn the game. And honestly, I think what helps even more is a good teacher, someone who knows. I can now teach that game so much better than the first time we played it <laughs> because I can tell people what to watch for and what to expect and why you might want to do things. And as opposed to the first game we played, and I'm like, I don't know what that symbol is. It's on your card. So yeah, all the boss, hopefully, uh, get that reviewed. And um, we're also talking about doing a gaming date night at home as well. So we'll see if we can fit both in, um, which we're we're just being, you know, not good because the sale pissed us off enough that we're like, we're just going to take off, screw the sale. No, so we, we had bad timing on this, but we got gift cards and stuff like that we want to use up and we got a good deal. So we're going to take off, do that, but then we're probably going to do a game night at home. I'm hoping to play some of the newer stuff we've got um basically some of the stuff we've unboxed some more videos that are coming out some of the stuff we've been talking about um i'm going to do the proper thing and play them two player with deanna so we can figure them out before i introduce them to other players which i kind of failed on with the last batch of games um plus we're going to brenda's on sunday in that case the kids are probably going to beg me to bring Ven because they are really did enjoy it um but i really want to play mountains out of mojos so the goal is to try that two player with deanna the one night and then bring it over the next night because of all the games i got that's the one i'm still the most hyped about and now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our vip guests our patreon backers we greatly appreciate their support brian kurtz thanks brian jeff and sheila seuss thank you seusses pat and tori we saved richie but we may never escape at this rate william fisher thank you Danielle and Owen Thomas, thanks both of you and a call out to Owen, who is super talkative tonight. Thanks for keeping the chat moving. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means our shift's coming to an end and it's time to shut the front doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is tabletopbellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. Uh, before you go, don't forget to tip your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and get some cool bonus stuff like behind the scenes show notes. And at least this next week coming up, lots of bonus audio. Well, that wraps up the time we have tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. You're welcome to stick around for our penthouse suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.